Okay, I'm starting the recording right now. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Caden. I'm with the Aperio Foundation and uh, with me I have Dr. Bruce Kirchhoff. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Cool. cool. So I'm going to tell uh, you a little bit about the Aperio Foundation, then introduce uh, Dr. Kirchhoff and the rest of the presentation will be, will be from him. Um, so the Aperio Foundation is a New, New Jersey registered nonprofit corporation which acts as a steward for open source software projects uh, serving education. It is a membership uh, driven organization, uh, voluntary, with around 80 educational and commercial partners worldwide. Aperio has around 60% of its membership in North America, but also has strong groups in Europe, South Africa, and Japan. Aperio has a close working with relationship with its sister organization in France, ESA Portiel, which I guessing I'm not pronouncing right, but hopefully close. ESUP has 72 members representing around 80% of French higher education. So you can count Aperio's close inner network at around 150 institutions. Our software, of course, is much more widely adopted, Sakai, uh, for which I'm a community, the community coordinator. A collaboration and learning environment is used by over 250 institutions, uh, while CAS, for example, providing single sign-on to a variety of system has been adopted by thousands and we have uh, probably you know a dozen to 18 different um, projects, open source projects, mostly under the Apache uh, license version two, or some under educational community license community license version two. Very similar uh, open source software. Uh, Perio onboards new software community through its incubation process. Uh, this process is based on our based on our community's experience. Helps a software project that take the first steps towards sustainability. Um, if you want to find more details about Aperio, about our software communities, uh, or about our incubation process, you might want to go to www.aperio.org. And I see a shout out for New Jersey. <laughs> so nice. And uh, again, I'm Neil Caden. I work for the Aperio Foundation. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Kirchhoff. Um, Let's see and find his introduction here. So Bruce Kirchhoff is a professor of biology at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He has won the UNC Board of Governors Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Charles Edwin Bessey Teaching Award from the Botanical Society of America, and the Innovations in Plant System Systematics Education Prize from the American Society of Plant Taxonomists. He designed and developed, but did not program, most of the software you will learn about today. You can reach him at Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff at uncg.edu, which I'll paste in the chat. And I will now turn it over to you, Bruce. Hi, good. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I see a lot of names that I know and a few that I don't. So um, we're going to be talking about visual learning today and about some of the software that Aperio has adopted to help with visual learning. Our goal is to get the software out there and being used more and hopefully develop a community of users and developers around the software. This talk is more developed, more oriented toward users, but we're hoping that if some of you know programmers who would like to be involved in the project, we do have some work that needs to be done to get these programs more widely available. So we're going to start out by talking about some principles of cognitive psychology and how they apply to, apply to learning, especially to visual learning. I'm going to talk a little bit about concepts and the nature of concepts according to a cognitive, cognitive psychology perspective. And then we'll kind of conclude the first part of the introduction with talking about some unique features of the visual, visual cortex and how our visual system works. I think these things have really important implications for education, but they haven't been um, well, they're not well known in the pedagogical literature. And so perhaps some of the things I'll say will be new to you today. Then in the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about the software. Um, the software, the turnkey parts of the software have all been oriented mostly around plant kinds of things because I'm a botanist. But you can easily add your own images. And so the software we've developed is easily adaptable to any kind of domain, learning domain, where you do visual learning or visual learnings applicable. And we'll talk about how you can add your own images there. So let's start with a, with a story. So a few years ago, I had a girl in my class. And we'll call her Sarah, which isn't her real name. 
but at midterm, Sarah was essentially failing. She had a low D. I've been telling the students some techniques to help them improve their grade all through the semester. And like most students, Sarah wasn't using them. She wasn't doing it. The advantage uh, that Sarah had was that she was a member of the soccer team. And she was going to lose her place on that team if she didn't pull her grades up. And so her coach made her do the techniques. She made her use the techniques that I'm about to tell you about. And these are techniques then that have later been incorporated into the software. So <clears throat> um, what was the result of this? At the final, Sarah had a B, which means she went from failing to a B by the end of the semester, which means for, went from getting Ds on every assignment to getting an A on every assignment in the space of about two weeks. Well, these amazing techniques I call the white paper method. And I know that some of you know about this, this idea uh, that I'm going to call the white paper method. And it starts with what I say is the student's best friend, a white blank piece of paper and a pencil. So the student takes and looks at the material that they want to study, either from their textbooks or ideally from good notes that they've taken in lecture. They find a portion of that, a section of that, that they would like to work on in this study session. They look over those notes briefly to kind of put in their mind what they're going to study. And then they close all of that and put it away, take their pencil and white paper, and write down everything that they know about that subject. In my case, I'm often having students learn li plant life cycles. They draw out the life cycle as best they can. They then open their book again get immediate feedback on how they've done, take a different color pencil, correct what they've done, and now they've got it correct in front of them. And now the hardest part comes, the part that the students, if they'll do that first part, the part that they really don't like to do. You take that piece of annotated white paper and you throw it away. And you take a new piece of white paper and you do the whole thing again right then. You repeat this cycle again, you write out everything you know, you correct it again if there needs to be corrected, you complete that process several times until you can do it perfectly. You can repeat the material that you need to learn perfectly. If you do that two or three times before the exam, pretty much you're guaranteed an A, and the students who have done it have found that out. I don't have a lot of students who will do it, but some students, even poor students, once in a while, they'll come back to my office and say, yeah, I started using that technique. I do it in all my classes now, and my grades have gone up tremendously. Thank you for teaching us that. So it's getting the students to do these effective techniques. That's something that we really need to work on. One of the things we address with the software is ways to get them to do using effective techniques. Well, I call this the learning circle. Each turn of that circle then it involves recreating something from memory, getting immediate feedback from that, and then most importantly, redoing it. If you didn't get it right the first time, redoing it until you get it right. And then repeating that learning circle several times over the course of studying for an exam or in, within a course and those kinds of things. So we're going to embody those kinds of techniques in the software. Those ideas from the learning circle will be part of what we do in the software. If I don't point them out specifically, you now know to look for them as we go through what the software does. Well, these things work because, as I think many of us know, learning is really dependent upon what the learners do. We, they don't learn from us lecturing at them. They learn because they do something with what we give them in lecture or what we give them as homework or what we give them in labs if we're biology biologists, et cetera. So it's the activity of the learners that we really want to focus on. Well, let's turn very briefly and think a little bit about concepts. Concepts are the next really important thing we need to understand from a cognitive psychology perspective. And I'll try to illustrate this in a couple ways, mostly by this illustration of dogs. So let's say that you now are not a human being attending a webinar, but are an alien, first time on Earth and, cre and first time seeing these really weird organisms on Earth. And you encounter these strange organisms that humans call dogs. But you're only exposed to this kind of variability in the dogs. You know that dogs are like this. They're relatively small. Most of them have long hair. 
not always, but long hair is a good indication that it's a dog. And they have very high voices and heart problems often develop in these dogs. So that's your, concept, that's your concept of dog because that you've been exposed to. And it doesn't at all prepare you, especially when we take size into consideration of the full range of things. Now you are unlikely to call many of these kinds of things up here, especially something that looks like this, a dog because it doesn't at all fit your concept of dog that you've come here. So it's well known in cognitive psychology that concepts encode variation. They don't just encode a typical member of the class, but they encode variation in the class. And in the slides that you can download, there'll be references for all of these things. There's a couple key references that you can look at to, that summarize this work in cognitive psychology about concepts. They'll also be on the last slide in this series, but that's going to go by pretty fast. So concepts and code variation. Unfortunately, virtually every textbook, well, OK, not virtually, every textbook that I've ever seen does not take this fact into account. They present um, conceptual material in one way. And you just can't learn it from hearing it in one way or from seeing something represented in one way. You have to have it represented in multiple kinds of ways. If you're going to learn what dogs are, you've got to be exposed to the full range of variation in, the do in dogs. And I hope that this has shown that. And by the way, if you're paying attention, there's a little visual joke down here at the uh, bottom lower le left. That's not a dog. Turning to visual learning itself. So what can we say about the types of visual learning? So there are, I'm not going to try and categorize visual learning in general. I'm not sure you can even do that. I am going to kind of partition the variability of visual learning into two broad kinds of classes represented by these two images. I mean, images here on the left of a face and on the right of some diagrams. We'll start with the face. So the kind of visual learning that takes place when a student looks at a new class of objects, are alien looking at dogs for the first time, a human being looking at um, pictures of plants for the first time, or even at, at the living plants for the first time, really seeing them for the first time, uh, um, a student looking at a work of art when they've never ha been exposed to art in their high school careers, et cetera. These new kinds of visual domains for those are, use a part of our brain or challenge us to use a part of our brain that we don't usually use. Let me just say that in, in a completely different way now. I'm going to say the same thing, but I'm going to say it from the opposite point of view. When we look as visual experts in a domain where we're well acquainted with, like looking at faces, especially faces of our own race, we see that object as a whole. We don't just look at the parts. Whereas the student looking in a new visual domain tends to see the parts. In fact, we can say that the person who looks, who's the expert in the visual domain and the student don't see the same thing at all. And I'll illustrate that in the next few slides where we talk a little bit more about this. These findings that I'm talking about are very strongly experimentally and neurologically based. Well, that's one type of visual learning then, that visual learning that acquaints a student with a new type of seeing, a seeing in a domain where they don't have any experience. The second type deals with these kinds of schematics. And I've I put schematics up on the screen here from life cycles because I teach plant life cycles. But if you work in a um, learning domain where you can summarize information in some kind of a schematic, that schematic, it doesn't have the same characteristics as the faces, but it summarizes a lot of information that the student would otherwise have to memorize. You can see that these uh, diagrams are all roughly the same. They all have a single horizontal line on them, etc. So they're drawn all in roughly the same way. They have the same types of names in the same places, like there's this weird word meiosis down here. I'm assuming that we have non-biologists in the in the audience, and so I'm not. I'm going to uh, try to explain these in very general terms. So we have this word meiosis always in the same place, and then above the line on the other side we have syngamy or the word fertilization, which are really two different words for the same process. 
So there's this archetypal way in which these diagrams are drawn, a standardized way. If the students can learn these by heart, they learn not just um, these few little words, but they learn they get a whole lot of extra information on here. So they learn about the structures that they have here. They learn about their roles that they play within the life cycle. They learn about, um, when I say their structures, I also mean they learn about their genetic structures. So there are things in the genetics of these things, whether these organisms are what we call diploid or haploid. And if they can picture where these parts of the life cycle occur in these diagrams, they know immediately what the what the genetics, something about the genetics of those parts of the organisms. And these are things that we normally would have them learn, memorize in the class. But now they don't have to memorize it because they've encoded that information. So when I get my students to learn these life cycles, they will sometimes, when they have to answer a question about ploidy, about the, about the um, genetics of these parts of the life cycle, or on other kinds of higher level kinds of questions, they will draw out a life cycle next to the question. And they will use that life cycle then to answer the question because the life cycle incorporates that information in it. So a second type of information using summarizing information in, um, in diagrams. Well, let's return to the first type. And as I've said, when we give some student something new to look at, a new plant, a new molecule, a new picture from art history, we think that they see this. We think that they see what we see, something that's like a face, something where we see the whole configuration. But in fact, the students don't see that. When we're looking at a face like this, we see the configuration or the relationship between parts. That's expert mode of visual cognition. What a student sees is this. They see the parts isolated. They can pick out the individual parts, but they don't see the relationship between those parts. And so if you've ever had the experience where you're giving a lecture or presenting something and the students just look completely mystified by what you're saying, it's probably not because they don't understand what you're saying. It's because they can't see what you're showing them. They can't see that slide that's up there. They can't see all those things that you see in it. They see something like a face that's been split apart like this. I want to bring this point across in the most vivid possible way I can by using the this example. So we're going to look next at these pretty much normally appearing faces. And then I am going to flip them over. And you're going to see that they don't look normal at all. There's something wrong with that face on the right. Why didn't you see that here? You didn't see that because you're not an expert in looking at upside down faces. You're a visual expert at looking at right side up faces, but not upside down. So here you're looking at the parts. And so when we look at these parts, these parts look OK. But when we flip it upside down, we're actually using a different part of our brain. And now we're looking at the whole configuration. We see those parts in the context. And it's clearly not OK. We've got a little, we've got a little problem with that face on the right. Well, as I've said, these kinds of changes in visual processing are neurologically based. These are some brain scans coming out of the paper that's cited down here. The full citation will be in the uh, slides you can download. It's a summary paper that summarizes a lot of work on this in this field. Excuse me. And uh, here's what it shows. So we're going to deal with two types of people here. We're going to deal with car experts. So car experts, that's like a NASCAR fan, right? They can name every kind of car. They can tell you the kind of engine in it. They know what model it is, what year it was made in. Probably if they had to look at a bird, they might know it was a bird and could fly, and that's about it. Here we've got bird experts. Bird experts are they can tell any kind of bird in when it, from a glimpse of it. They see it flying over. They can get its jizz. They know what it is. They look at a car, and they have no idea. They might know what kind of car they're driving on this. So we're going to do some brain scans of these people. When, they, when the car experts look at faces, we find activation in this area of the brain called the right fusiform face area. And also for the bird experts, we find activation in that part of the brain when they look at faces. The car experts looking at cars, activation there. The bird experts looking at cars, essentially no activation. Bird experts looking, I'm sorry, that was, yeah, bird experts looking at cars. The car experts looking at birds, no activation. 
the bird experts looking at birds activation in that area. So we're seeing that this is a phenomenon, this activation of this right fusiform face area is a phenomenon of experience. And that's the good news here. The bad news was that the students can't initially see what we're showing them. The good news is they can be trained and the training is not that hard. So that's one of the kinds of things that we're doing with some versions of the software. And I'll tell you more about that as we go on. One way that we're going to address this in the software is by the um, good selection of images. So we're going to choose images and take images that are standardized as much as possible. So when you start looking at the plant software that we have, the images in that software are by and large standardized. That means that all when we have a picture of a leaf, the picture of the leaf is drawn so that the tip of the leaf is at the base of the picture, etc. When there's a picture of the bark, the bark is looking straight on at the bark um, of, at a kind of breast height, etc. like that. And all the images in the software are like that. It's a lot of work to do that, but it has the payoffs that it makes it easier for the students to ignore the background material to focus on the configural nature of these images. My colleague Steve Baskoff at Vanderbilt has been instrumental in developing these kinds of um, image standards for plant photography. OK, let's turn to the software. Um, we're going to look at two versions of the software today. The first version is called Image Quiz. And that's a little confusing because we're also talking about the image quiz project and there are different types of soft there's two types of software in the image quiz project but this is the first one called image quiz so this software is written in c++ it runs on both mac and pc so there's both versions out there there's a couple turnkey versions of the software they are for the kinds of things that i teach so plant um, structure, plant life cycles, but there's also one for organic chemistry, for organic functional groups. And my main point here is that it's very easy to adapt the software to your own uh, learning domains. And I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. We'll look at the software and how it works uh, first. So written in, written in C++ runs on Mac and PC. And in this software, the images have um, the following characteristics. So it's easiest perhaps to think about this with an example from art history. So let's say you have a picture of Picasso's or an image of Picasso's famous um, uh, painting Guernica. And that picture for the software would have a, a class name. For instance, it might be in the class called Picasso, and that class would contain all of the pictures of Picasso that we had pictures of. And then there would be certain properties of that individual image. So it's a picture by Picasso, but it's his specific picture, Guernica. It is in the form of cubism or kind of proto-cubism, and it was done in 1937. So we've got the class name, Picasso, the name of the image, Guernica, the style, cubism, and the date it was done, 37. And anything else you wanted <clears throat> students to know about that picture could be given as a property. So in this kind of, in this software, we have images with kind of class names and then properties on this. Let's look at how you would select some images for use in the software. So we click on that first button on the main opening screen, and we see something like this. What we see over here in the select images, these are the class names. So if we were doing art history, one of those names would say Picasso. This is all easily, very easily customizable. If you were working in a different group of plants or if you were working in um, completely different art, art history terms or anything else, you would have your own things here and you could customize that very easily. The ones we've selected appear over here on this other side. And then we can select from down here, we can select if we want them to learn one of the properties. In this case, it's the name of the structure or the name of the plant that we're dealing with. 
And then we have the option of the students learning either only the property, which would be structure or genus here, only the name, which would be this name up here, or they could learn the name and the property. I mostly use this software to teach these properties of the images. I want the students to know something about the images. We'll do an example in just a second. First of all, we'll take a look at a quiz. So what are the quiz? Um, what kinds of quizzes can we do? Let me say first that the difference between the quiz and the test, you're gonna see them both here. They're essentially the same, except for in a quiz, the student gets feedback after every answer. So it's implementing part of the learning circle that we've talked about. In a test, it's a way of testing themselves. So they get feedback only at the end of the test. Other than that, quizzes and tests are basically the same. There's one other difference I'll talk about right now. So we've clicked on that quiz button. We're going into the quiz options selection box, and we see that there are four types of quizzes that you can take. I said there was one more difference between quizzes and tests, and that is this. This image naming with prompt is only option is only available in quizzes. Let me describe what it is, and you'll see why it's only available in quizzes. So an image appears on the screen. The property of that image appears on the screen. So Guernica appears on the screen. The date 1937 appears on the screen. A response box appears on the screen. The student types 1937 into that response box. It's pretty easy. And for that case, you might not ever do it. But if, you ha if your answer is anthophyta and the students have never seen the word anthophyta and they don't know how to spell it, you would want them to have some practice spelling that name and associating it with that image before they're actually having to do some harder kinds of tests on it. So image naming without with prompt is only available in the quiz mode. The next one is the real learning high, uh, difficult high learning one, image naming without prompt. We look at that. <clears throat> and the uh, students see an image on the screen. The image is, disappears from the screen. A response box appears. The students have to type the property in there. If it's the name, the date of the artwork, the name of the structure that's being shown, etc. So they get no help on this. In the quiz version, they get feedback immediately. In the test version, they go finish the test before they get any feedback. That's a very hard kind of thing for students to do. You might want them to do some other kinds of um, routines first. Image comparison is a little easier. You see two images on the screen, and the student has to say if the property they're looking for is the same in those two images. So uh, we don't have a good his his example from history of art here, but you might say if it's you know it's got two different pictures of a lobed leaf. Uh, palmately lobed leaf, and that was what you were looking for in the property. And if it's two pictures of a palmately lobed leaf, they say yes. If it's not, if it's one palmately lobed and one pinnately lobed, they say no, and then they get immediate feedback on that. Image verification is the last one. In image verification, they see a image, it disappears. A possible name for that image, a possible property for that image disappears. It disappears, a response box appears, the student responds yes if the image and the property match, and they respond no if they don't. Again, they get immediate feedback. We'll look at one example. So here is image naming with prompt. We have our image on the screen. It's a plant, piece of part of a plant. We have a specific part of that image identified, so they know that they're supposed to be looking at those things. Here's the response that they are supposed to enter, and they enter that response in the response box. And press OK or just hit return. All of these things work from the keyboard. You don't have to use the mouse. Most students do use the mouse, but it's not required by the software. So that's image naming with prompt. They get it right. They get positive feedback. What that positive feedback is rotates each time. They get a different word. If they get it wrong, they see this screen. 
They can press yes and see the correct answer and repeat the question. They can repeat the question without the correct answer, or they can just go on. So they have a chance to redo it. In general, you should always press yes there and see the answer, yes or R, and go on and do the question again. Before, so you leave it. Leave with the answer correct. There are some advanced options that are important to point out. They're accessible through the advanced options menu on the home screen, kind of at the top. There's that little bar at the top, and you under that, there's an advanced options. You can set the spelling sensitivity. So that can be set down to 70%. It starts out to fall at 100, but most students will find this, or you can tell them about it, and they go down and set it to 90%, which I think is pretty safe. They can miss a, um, if, you know, if they retype something, I'm sorry, if they make a single letter spelling mistake, this will normally allow that to happen. And so they don't get too frustrated because they say, oh, I knew the answer to that, but my fingers are just not working. They can go on. In that same dialog box, we have the possibility of selecting the number of images. In some cases, I have 100 images or more with the same property on them. There's no way I want the students to do 100 images of that property. Remember, we're trying to encode variation here. And so they can select a smaller subset of those. And the program will go and randomly sample out of all of the images with that property and show them 15 or 20 or 25 or whatever they want. There's other options here, but we'll leave those for now to a more advanced webinar. Let's look at the study routines here. Just going to do this very briefly because the study routines are um, very useful as flashcards. So there are lots of flashcard options out on the web. We've got flashcard option built into the software also. If what you really want are flashcards, not places where you actually have to do active learning, where you actually have to respond to it, the flashcard option will give you a very, very flexible way of using of reviewing these kinds of things. So I've said reviewing now. So the flashcards, the study options are really useful in two kinds of conditions. One, the initial exposure of the students to this image domain is um, probably not the best to do that with quizzes, probably the best to ask them to use the study routines to look through the images first so they get an idea. So if you're teaching them to identify, you know, they're an alien and you're teaching them to identify dogs, you want them to have a quick overview of what all dogs look like first before they start to do any active learning on that. That's the first way that study is useful. Second way it's useful is if a student is about to go into a quiz or an exam and they want to quickly flip through the kinds of things that they've been working on, you can set up very quickly, you can set up flashcards here, run through all the images again, and re refresh their memory on what the different parts of the, that they, what the different um, properties of the images are. So here's some of the settings. You can look at the images in alphabetical order or they can be randomized. It's alphabetical order by their class name. You can look at, you can advance the keys with the arrow keys or you can advance them with an auto image display. And when you select that, this box down here becomes active. The slider becomes active and they can set that from a tenth of a second to four seconds. Usually these are used at relatively high display times, meaning a second or more. But there's a funny thing about visual expertise. When you're really good at, when you're really a visual expert at something, it's much easier for you to do these tasks at a tenth of a second than, a four, than at four seconds. That's a hard sell for students. But I know some of the people in this um, webinar are visual experts in different domains, and perhaps you can identify that with. It's much easier to get what an image is or the properties of an image from a gl glance at the image than from taking a long time to study it. So we can also look, um, we can show the image with its name or we can show the image only here. So the image can appear with the name over superimposed or the image only on that. And we can look, here's one setup where you might use it. So here's one where we've selected all of the one, all of the options as you might set up a flashcard setting for yourself. Randomize the images, do audit image display, have the image appear and then disappear, and then the name or the property of that image appear afterwards. So you see the image, you have a glance, 
class, a chance to do it quickly in your head, and then the correct name appears, and then it stops, the program stops until you press the key, and then it shows you the next image. Right now, we've got this set for 1.7 seconds, and that could be taken down to very quick image display times because it's going to wait for you to press the key to go to the next image. OK, I said I'd tell you how to put your own images in this software. It's extremely easy to understand what we need to do for that. We're going to look at the images that are the, the um, directories and the files that are in the installation directory. So you install image quiz on your soft on your laptop and you open the directory where you put it in. Uh, installation is just a matter of copying the files out of a zip archive. And you see this. We've got a help directory. We don't need to look in there. We've got the images itself. We'll look in there in just one second. There's some user files that is, you have to log in with your username, and that stores there. We don't need to look there. And we have the database. We'll look at that database. So we're going to look at the images in the database. Here's the program itself. And then there's some licenses and other information down here. This is the license for Aperio's license, and this is the licenses for the images. You should put some note, something in here about the uh, who can use your images for what. And that's all available in the ones, the turnkey versions what we've got out there for plan identification and kinds of things. OK, here's a directory listing of some of the images in this is called IQ Plant Diversity, this program. And it teaches plant diversity terminology. A couple things to notice here. First, you see the same image but that image has got different things highlighted on it. So the same image can be used to identify or for the students to learn different parts of that image. You just put a box or an arrow on the image. There's a number of programs that are out there that are very easy to use that will allow you to do this. Certainly, you can use Photoshop to do it, but it's really overkill. There are much easier and faster ways to get those annotations on your images. Second thing is the names can be anything. These are very long file names. And I'll say more about those in a minute. But the names are very flexible. You just name the program, whatever, name the image, whatever you want. Let's look at the database. So I've opened the database. It is a CSV file, comma, separated value file, which means it's a text file with commas between each each field and a hard return, a line return at the end of each line. That op those files open in Excel. And so here we have it displayed in Excel. You can create them in Excel, and you can save them in the proper format in Excel. Program does not read Excel files, but you can save them in the right format from, ex from within Excel. Here we see what's <clears throat> in that file. We see that each image is identified by its name. That was the same name we saw on the image a second ago. It had a .jpg on it when it was on, um, when it was the image file itself. That's been removed. It's got the name. This is like the class name that's going to appear in that first image selection box. So though that image selection box is populated automatically from this list. You could have Anthrophyta in here a thousand times, and it's going to appear once in that box. And when you select Anthophyta from that first box, those 1,000 images are going to be selected. So the program knows what's in, this, what's in this database file, and it's doing the work for you. It's making those dialog boxes for you. Then you've got the properties. We've got two properties here, as you recall, the structure and the genus. This picture is a picture of an anther, and this genus it happens to be the genus Brassica. It could be anything. So again, if this was Picasso's Guernica, um, the image name would be Picasso, the struct, and then there would be different names up here. And it wouldn't say structure and genus. It would say artist, maybe. That would be Picasso. It could say name of work. That would be Guernica. It could see date created. That would be 1937. And those names here, these names here, would appear in that drop down box you saw. So that you could select the property from this. Again, that's populated automatically for you. So basically, you create the images, you create the database file, and the program does the rest for you. 
So what kind of things has this program been used for? It's been used to teach life cycles. So here's a plant life cycle, and it is completely um, populated here. I teach this in lecture, and then I have students do this. Here's it is in the program. Same drawing of the life cycle. Almost all the words have been blacked out. One is highlighted with a red box, and the student there has to know to type megasporangium. So it's almost as good as the white paper method. It certainly gets them to the point where they're willing to do the white paper method. I think I'm getting more people to do white paper now because they feel like they can accomplish it pretty well the first time. They're just correcting a few things based on work with the software. Also, it's been used in organic chemistry. My colleague, um, Mitch Croat, in chemistry here at UNC Greensboro, has created these images and uses this in his organic chemistry class. He wants the students to know, first thing when they walk in the door, they've got to identify functional groups for organic chemistry. All organic chemistry is based on the interaction of molecules based on these functional groups. So the students have got to know them cold. He has drawn these molecules, different molecules you notice with the same functional group and alcohol here. And the answer here would be alcohol when they do these in the software. And by the way, he makes them do this at a tenth of a second. He will not, he ha accepts only um, answers that are 100% correct and they have to be done at one tenth of a second and they have to do them with all the amino acids selected. So it's a pretty hard task and they got to get that done within the first two weeks of the class. But it founds, forms the foundation of the rest of the semester. The Software, I haven't gone over how the software uh, works with grades, but it's watching. The whole time the student's using it, it's watching what they're doing and it's recording their results. And there are easy ways to get that information out and for the students to hand something in. So it's pretty trivial to give assignments from here and to track students' progress for the assignments that you give. I was giving one or two assignments every week with this software. Here's an example from art history. Let's say you wanted the students to learn the difference between um, figurative and abstract art, represented here by a Bruegel and a Kaczynski. Kaczyn, um, Kaczyn, can't pronounce it anymore. It's been too long since I have um, Kaczynski. I hope that's right. The um, difference between abstract and figurative art is not that easy for students. It seems really trivial for people who have looked at a lot of art. It's not easy for students. I've picked a very um, strong example here to show the kinds of things that you could do to get the students started on this. You would, of course, could grade them up to less clear examples in the, between the difference. But once they could tell the difference between these kinds of artistic styles, it prepares them for higher level cognitive tasks, the kinds of cognitive tasks that art historians expect students to do even in introductory courses. And those are things like analyze the um, role of abstraction and figurative art within an intermediate work like this work by Picasso. So this is a this kind of work with the image quiz helping the students see can be the foundation for success at much level higher cognitive tasks. Let's go on and look at the other um, software we've got. This is a software that I call visual learning, or VL. If you see them on the web, they're usually going to be called VL dash something. So, instance, for, so for instance, this one is visual learning plant identification, or vis, VL dash PI. There are versions of this for plant identification in Australia, and also for herpetology identification. So the big difference between this software and the image quiz software we've just looked at is that this software works with objects or photographs that are in a hierarchy. So I know the biologists in the group know all about this. I'll just review it very briefly for folks who don't. The um, biological organisms occur within a hierarchy. So they are all organisms are a member of a species, a member of a genus, and a member of a family, and additional ones above that. But those three are ones we're concentrating on right now. There are multiple genera within a family and multiple species within a genus. So there is a hierarchy here. This software works with images in that hierarchy. 
It's most suited, it was designed to work with organisms, but if you have anything that occurs in that kind of a hierarchy, and there are probably other examples out there that people can think of, this software will work with them. Again, it's very easy to add your own images to this software, and I'm not going to go over that today, but if people are interested in that, I'd be happy to walk you through it or to make another video to show you how to do that. The process is essentially the same as I've shown you already. You change the images, you change the database. There's a few little tweaks you got to do extra, but it's nothing major from what I've told you already. So that's the major difference here. The other difference with the software is that it is much more sophisticated than what we've seen already. It's sophisticated in a couple different ways. We'll look at two of those ways very quickly. First, it has there's a way that group selection works here. So we can select organisms, or taxa they're called, for study in lots of different ways. We'll look at one of those ways. Here's the dialog box to select groups to work with. Again, this you create a database, and this is automatically all created for you. You can have any number of mechanisms of selecting it here. This one has got three. If we look at the herpetology program, it's got about 10 different ways to select it here. That all comes out of the database, automatically generated. You don't have to know any programming or do anything to make that happen. So we see that we can select by the type of thing that's shown in the picture by the genus or by the family. Once we've done that, we can select within the hierarchy whether we want to learn the organisms by family, by genus as is selected here, or by species, either by the scientific name or the common name. Common names only at the species level. Here's an example of what happens when you select one of those. We've selected one genus here, Ilex. The other boxes, like the family box over here, update automatically so that only the options that apply to Ilex appear over here. It's only in that one family. These are the morphologies or the types of pictures that are available for Ilex. If we were to select another one here, we were to sec select Abies, we would see another family appear here, the Pinaceae, and maybe a few other morphologies would appear. So there's other kinds of sophisticated selection mechanisms that are built into this program that aren't in the first one. By the way, Bruce, it looks like there's about 10 minutes left. Yep, we should finish. Um, okay. The next slides will go pretty fast. The, um, this is what we've done is we've clicked on load a script. So we can run scripts in here, which are kinds of macros. Load a script, this box appears, and now these are the selections of the scripts. Now you have to write the scripts for the students to do this, but there is a helper program that helps you do that. It's all point and click, no programming is necessary. You click on one of those, the script starts, and now the program is in automatic mode. You don't have to read this, but you can write, this is customized text, you can write anything you want there. Um, tell the students what you want to about the program that they're about to see. They click OK and confirm they want to continue. And now you're into the program. Here we have an example of image naming with prompt, the first routine in that script. The program is now watching what the students do for that script, and it's giving them a grade on the script. So let's look how that works. To see how that works, we're going to look. Here's our installation directory again. There's our grades directory in this. Notice there's a few other directories here. But we're going to open up that grades directory and look in there. Here are the output from running a script. This is output from running the script. So every time that someone runs a script, one of these files is created. So here's Alex ran this one. Here's me, I ran this one. It has the name of the script. Here's the first part, the name of the script. The script was called 02 turn in Quercus alba and bicolor. Alex ran it. Alex ran it on this date. And it's another comma separated value file. Let's look into one of the, oh, and there's a little index number here. The index number is an indication how many times the person ran the script. If they've run it two times, that would be a two, a three, et cetera. And you, the student can rerun the scripts as many times as they need to get to the level of proficiency that you have set for them. So you assign them a script. You say, do this script until you get 90% right. 
and they get feedback. They know that they've gotten 90% right, and then they know what to turn in. They email you those scripts or turn it in on Sakai or on Blackboard or Canvas. And here's what you see when you open a script. This is, again, in Excel. There's the name of the script, the name of the session that they were doing. There's um, the date that they took it. Here are some of the th things about the taxa that they were working on. And here's their grade on that, their overall grade down here. Um, the final score is a little check that I have in there for cheating. And I don't have time to go into how that works right now. But I would just say for the moment, don't worry about it. You can open these files and check their overall scores. Or again, we have a second helper program that will help you do the grading on those. Unfortunately, it needs a little, that program only works with Blackboard right now. And so we do need some programming help. I make another plea. If there are programmers out there listening to this and they'd like to help with the project, there's a few small things that we need. It would be really helpful to get that helper program to help with the grading working with other content management systems like Sakai. OK, so here we have the results of a controlled test we did. The reference for this will be in the um, PowerPoint or the PDFs you can download, and it'll appear in a minute on the next one. We ran this in a, in a real classroom situation. They used the software to learn plan identification, or they used their normal study methods. It was a very robust um, study design. It's published in a peer-reviewed journal, and we got about 25% better performance with the software. Not only did we get better performance with the software, but it persisted after six months. So here's, a, here's the results from the exam time. We tested the students on, at, we trained them and tested them at the genus level. We saw that they did much better with the software. We brought them back six months later and retested them. Of course, they did not nearly as well. There was a considerable decline in performance, but the performance was, again, much better with use in the software. Not only did we get better results over time like this, but remember, I just said we tested them on the genus. Whoops, I have the wrong. Not only did we test them on the genus, but we tested them on family, too. So we tested them not on genus, but on family. We got similar results from the family. But remember, we didn't train them on the family. So we got better results with the software when we asked them questions that they didn't do training on. So they transferred their knowledge from training area, where they train on the genus level, to the family level. That's not easy to achieve. You get transfer of learning like, like that. But we did achieve it with the software. Well, that's it. A brief overview and a quick uh, idea on how you might add some of the images to your software. Here are the references that I would talk about. The boroughs, this one and this one, are the two experimental tests of the software. The Kirchhoff first author is the one I was just talking about. The boroughs one was tested in Australia. Um, with students coming into an agricultural program there. A little bit different experimental design there. This is the reference about visual learning, a nice summary of the no knowledge up until 2006. McDaniel is an expert in the cognitive psychology of learning. He's written a lot of papers and books about this. This is about that method of learning that is essentially the white, what I call the white paper method. Um, the essence of that method is known as sprint in cognitive psychology. Wisniewski was a colleague here at UNC Greensboro until his retirement a couple years ago. He wrote a very nice summary review of what's known about concepts and categorization from a cognitive psychology perspective. So again, those references will be at that Google Drive um, document that Neil has just linked you to. I think we have a minute or two for questions. And don't forget your email sign up as well, Bruce. Yes, can you post that? Um, uh, so we, if you are not on my email list, I'm, I recognize a good number of names there, but not everyone. If you are not on my email list and you'd like to be, 
we have a way for you to give us your email address. It's at the top of this of the chat, and I'm hoping that Neil will put it back there. Right? Copy it if I unless you have it. Let's see. I don't have it. Um, I will find a way to copy it here. If I let can. me see if I can. Oh, I think I can copy it. You got it. I think so. Copy link location. And paste it down here. Yeah. Okay. And so just click on that link, and you can add your email address. You can unmute your microphone and ask, or type a question if you have any. I, I did have my my questions were a little bit more on the about the technical you know technical questions about it versus the process. Um, for example, what what uh, pro platforms does it run on? Um, PC and Mac. Um, it does not run on tablets or uh, handheld devices. It'd be great to be able to do that, but we just need to get some programmers involved so that we can make that work. So right now it's on laptops or desktop computers, but it doesn't run under either operating system. Now the two, Java should be possibly to make that work a little more easy on other, on other platforms than the C++, which would probably have to be completely be re rewritten. Mm. I was also interested, but you kind of answered the question about the spelling issue, but you have that built in, which I thought was kind of kind of, kind of cool. Yes, the students do get frustrated by that sometimes, and I don't always remember to tell them. Maybe that's on purpose. Hmm. Um, <laughs> but they find it. Some of them find it, and they, they set it at 90. Then, you know, the, the students who want to game the system, We've made it hard for them to do it, but they can still do it because they can set the spelling down to 70%. But then they start losing points on the exams and they start to realize that's not a good strategy. So they'll that kind of gets self-correcting after a while. Mm -hmm. I'm curious whether this is a tool that also, and I know we're just getting over time here, but this is also a tool that's, that students might find a value if they for their own data, like if they wanted to set up their own study. Or do you think that's something that's not likely they would put want to put that kind of effort into it? Um, it's hard for me to say whether they're really going to put that effort in or not. Um, I think the better students might. I don't know if the poorer students are ever going to do that. The students here at our university have such full lives that it's unlikely they're going to do anything that's not really required. You know, many of them are, if they're not working full time, they're working three quarters time, they're paying for their own way. They often have families, sometimes new babies, and they're still trying to go to school. They still are going to school. I have a student working in my lab and in my classes now who has a less than a one-year-old and she does pretty good. It's just amazing what they what they do, what they have to do to get their education. So those kinds of students, you know, are going to do what you assign for them. Not even the good students there, they just don't have the time in their lives mm -hmm. to make it work. Sure. So I'm hopeful that some students will pick it up and want to learn it on their own. I see Marsh has a question here, and um, I'll send you the links to this. Um, I, the, let's see, we have it all available, I think, right now. It's just in different, um, platform. So the source code for the visual learning software, especially for VLPI, is available. And the downloads are available from Aperio's GitHub site. GitHub is a repository for software code. Eventually, everything is intended to, we intend to put everything up there. So those things are available right now from that. I have made available through other repositories, Google Drive, et cetera, the other parts of the software. And I can send the links to those out again. The, I think the links can also be put up, at least to the Aperio stuff. That will be go up on the Aperio's Image Quiz website, I think. Is that right, Neil? I, I would assume so. I'm not familiar with the, that particular repository, but that, that sounds right. So, um, so yes, they're available. They're available, and 
it's all everything's free and the software the source code is going to be free as soon as we get it put up so as i say the java code is up the c++ code we need a developer to help us get that up mm. so it's available in java and c++ so the image quiz the first one we looked at is c++ okay. and the second one is in java okay. and the java code has already been processed and put up for download the C++ code is not yet available. It needs a little work needs to be done on it, and then it'll be available for download. The cool. programs itself, the executable programs, are all available. The Java program is available from Imperial's repository. The other ones are available basically from me right now. They still have Imperial okay. licensing on them, but Imperial just hasn't gotten them up on its own repository yet. Yeah, we could always paste links, uh, post links up on the main Git uh, Perio repository over if there's a place you're, you're storing them locally that's available on the web. Yes, I can, we can do that as a temporary measure. Yep. Cool. Well, I see we're, we are a few minutes o over um, time, so maybe we should probably wrap up. I don't see any other questions coming in at the moment. OK, good. Well, everyone has my email address. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Bruce. Really appreciate uh, the presentation here. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.